maybe a good way to start and you can expand on this is you know how does and we i label this decentralized aircraft management you probably have a cool word for it but you know how does that decentralized aircraft management model work and how do you get to the scale that you guys are at right now yeah so two different questions obviously i mean i um i I think you know decentralized uh, let, let's cl- sort of codify and 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 think mm-hmm. through that. Um, I think there are a lot of aircraft management companies that you know can look out on the ramp and see their managed fleet, um, and there are a lot of benefits to that. And I, my first company, Sunset, was one of those companies. And though we grew to a couple of locations over fifteen years, you know, we always had people that were there watching the owners leave or the charter clients leave or whatever. And you could walk out and shake a hand and. And in a relationship business, which will be a big part of our conversation today, but in that business, that matters. I mean, and and so, you know, there's a missing component, certainly in our model, where I can't look out the window and and or or walk out my door and shake a hand of a client. I have to be more actively engaged. Um, So that's on the the bad side. I mean, I think the good side of it is that it, it is an opportunity to grow into that scale. You know, we can add an airplane somewhere in the middle of the country that we don't have necessarily an administrative presence. Um, and and all of our IT systems and the way we think about the business and the way we hire people and all that allow us to do that. And and actually COVID has been really interesting. And I, I'd like to, you know, we can talk a little bit about that, how that's impacted the company, mm-hmm. but that that's a change as well. To, you know, the, how we do it, though, I guess at the end of the day, you know, and it's it's the, it's almost cliche now, but it's people, right? I mean, the, the phrase I've always used was, you know, this we're about people, not planes. Um, and I think there are plenty of other companies that use that same phrase. And, and some, somebody should like trademark it or something. But, um, you know, I mean, I think it really is a people business. And I think the other component there is, as my mother used to say, know who you are and what you represent. Um, I am a big believer that there are aircraft charter companies who, you know, represent that they manage airplanes, and then there are management companies with 135 certificates. You can't be both. You got to decide what you're going to be. And mm-hmm. and I think there's a lot of identity crisis that happens in our business. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think we're in an industry, and and you and I have both seen it, where people will happily slit the throats of their friends and and competitors just to get after a $1,000 a month management uh, fee delta, whatever. Um, you know, look, I'm, I'm as competitive as the next guy, but I, you know, one thing that has come with scale is the luxury of being a little bit more thoughtful about growth and, and who we bring on board and, um, and how we think about that process. So do you think you almost have to recreate the business every you know, as you evolve. So if you look at this company, maybe five years from now, how different do you think Solaris is going to be five years from now than it is today? Yeah. Well, you have to, yeah, short answer. Yes. Yeah. So you got to be thinking about that. Right. Uh, and I, one thing that I'm really proud of, we don't rest on our laurels around here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's as much about, um, you know, my energy and, and, and John's, you, you know, John and I and Greg are very like-minded in that way that, uh, and Greg and Benvo and Melissa and Bob Marinese, you know, the whole team down the list, like everybody, we get on the phone once a week and talk about the shit that's broken. Mm-hmm. Right. I, th- there is, in fact, a, um, a consultant came in recently and was sort of like, well, you guys don't celebrate the wins enough. And it was such a foreign concept to everybody that like, Oh God, that's gross. Like we're not yeah. ringing any bells around here because there's an unattended consequence of, over celebrating also yep and i don't assume tomorrow's victory just because of yesterday's yep so that mindset of of constant improvement looking at everything constantly to say okay yes that worked in 2022 does it work in 2023 look the at the work from home thing good good example of that uh you know everybody that's hot on everybody's mind right now some people are looking at that and saying get your butts back to the office some people are looking at it and going no we're gonna we're gonna evolve a little bit here there's a different way to think about the business yeah i'm um, I'm definitely a pro work from office guy for yeah. me that's just because my preference 
maybe because I've got a, you know, a one-year-old and a three-year-old yeah. and background and, noise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, I can kind of focus, but at least for me, and I think it's different for a lot of people, but for me, I get into a mindset when I'm in an office and I, and I, you know, I get ready and I, I put pants on and, you know, I can get into a work mindset. Now, obviously I'm, this is a 24 hour business. So yeah. it's not like I can't get work done. Cause I, I've done, I, I've done hey, been there and done it right. Aviation business at anywhere you can think of. I've taken a call and I've, yeah. and I've done aviation business, mm-hmm. but um, you know, when I, when I think about being in the office, that just puts me to that mindset of, all right, it's, it's business time and it's time yeah, to get work done. Time. It's helps. Me. So, um, you know, now this isn't anything prolific or anything that other people haven't thought about, but I, for us, you may know, we had a lot of decentralized model, right? We had a yep. lot of, um, out of office employees going into COVID, yep. um, which put us in a unique position of not really missing a beat on, on, yep. the, on some of the stuff, um, flight coordinators, client services director, those were all people that were out of office for us already. And so culturally help some of your systems too, cause you already oh, have, oh, these there's systems. no doubt. And, and actually not only that, Dan, but if you want to know, um, John being brilliant, John had scheduled, um, for the week that we were going to go, um, that we ended up going remote, you know, I mean, it was very sudden, as you recall, it was the two John, week. Oh, we're going to take a two week break, right? No, he, he, he had actually said two weeks prior, he's like, we're going to run a drill in two weeks on computer systems shutting down. We've got, you know, in California, we're an earthquake and wildfire country. We have employees that have lost their homes to fires. So we think about those things, yeah. um, you know, in New York, you know, who knows what could happen there, but we wanted to test whether, sort of the the quote unquote emergency broadcast system right you know like okay can we can we flip the switch and have this company be remote john was getting ready to run that drill and was getting all everything sort of set up and then we there we were (laughs) it wasn't a drill yeah (laughs) Um, so you know goods and bads i would say um the analogy i use i i you know there, there are no more arguments about who left the tuna fish sandwich in the fridge over the weekend right i mean that that office culture is pretty much gone um almost entirely so when we bring people in we're doing one in a couple weeks where you know it's hey we're gonna do lunch and we're gonna you know dan and john are gonna talk for a little bit and i mean it's like people are hugging each other and they haven't seen each other It, it it's it's old home week i love that I love the the lack of arguing over tuna fish sandwiches and hey, you know who stole my stapler, um, but I miss the the congeniality and the 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 community. Um, however, comma, I, I have evolved when it comes to the work from home thing because I was probably more like you, where I'm, and I'm. By the way, I'm here every day. If yeah. I'm not on the road for work, I'm here. As are, I'm going to say, a, a, you know. A dozen or so people that are consistently five days a week here. Now, did John, um, I saw John in New York. Uh, yeah, yeah. Two days I, would, ago. I was out there. I was in. I was in the city. But yeah. you know, is John back in the office? Is he? Yeah, he was here yesterday. We were both here. We flew home Wednesday night, landed at one a.m. I was sitting in my desk at eight a.m. on Thursday nice. morning. So nice. no, it's not nice. It's totally messed up in the head. But I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, you know, in case my wife watches this, yes, I realize I'm an idiot, um, <laughs> but you know, that, that ability to travel like that is change is game changer. But yeah. you know, the notion that there are not 60 or 70 people here dispatch, for example, mm-hmm. as you know, our dispatch was a in Petaluma 24, seven, 365, you know, I would drive by the office at Saturday uh, at eight o'clock at night on the way to a dinner and the lights were on and it gave you this sense of like the world's under control. Right. So we've all had to pivot a little bit to realize that uh, and by the way, our talent pool, Dan, is yeah. is like incredible now mm-hmm. because we were able to be like, oh, there's Joe. He lives in, uh, you know, Topeka. Yeah, he's a great dispatcher. There's Mary. She's in, you know, Alabama, and she's a great flight. You know, so we were able to pivot a little bit how we thought about it. So the departments that were here traditionally Monday through Friday are now all remote: mm-hmm. dispatch, accounting, finance they come in on different schedules and as the the managers for the departments call for, mm-hmm. but it's requiring the managers to do some regional meetings or, or travel yeah. to see the employees. But 
on level, I would say COVID has, um, if I had to go, you know, it's, it's binary, it's either plus or minus. It's been a plus because wow. of the talent. That's it's, awesome. But to your point, we've had to evolve the culture to adjust to it. When, when you were going through this in 08, 07, 08, what's, how long did it take then? You know, obviously I think we're at the early signs of it and we can art and I can already see signs. It's just from coast to coast pricing from a yeah. lot of the one way providers clearly where, you know, eight months ago, the coast to coast super mid pricing was in the 40 thousands. And now it's, you know, almost 20 to 25% lower than it was. Yeah. Well, Those you are- remember, I mean, the, the, when EXO launched, it was the $17,000 one ways. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and I remember at the time, you know, we were, we were not a midsize operator though. We mm-hmm. had a couple, you know, we had one or two hawkers or whatever, but it was like, like, we can't even compete with that. Yeah. I mean, because you get out there and then what you could charge 17 or 18 maybe, and sort of break even to get out there. But then all of a sudden you're, you're yeah, one 30, overnight, two overnights. Yeah. There's only so many times. Night. Yeah. There's only so many times you can call sentient and, and beg for, <laughs> for a one way. Right. Um, uh, I'm hoping Andrew Collins hears that because he know he's been the recipient of that phone call from me, you know, 20 years ago. Like, please, I've had this crew sitting in uh, Chicago. Yeah, Yeah. wherever, wherever they're sitting, like, please get them home. Like, this guy needs to see his family. Um, I I don't know if it returns back to quite that, but it's, you know, I think we enjoyed this period of time where the the numbers got real. You know, but I I talked to a guy a couple of weeks ago um, who was talking about, yeah, you know, I mean, I used to go back and forth from Florida to New York and I just do one ways. He was sort of a, a serial one way hunter. Yep. And um, an opportunity came up. He lived in Florida and was going to New York and an opportunity came up to go, like go to a concert or something. And he started shopping and he was like, the best price I could get was $75,000 for, for the round trip or the, I don't remember which way it was, but he was like, you know what, that th- there was something that just clicked in his mind that yep. that's not worth it anymore. Yep. And so he booked a flight on like jet blue. Yep. And, and the problem was that he got off the jet blue flight. And instead of thinking, I'm never doing that again, he kind of went, ah, you know, it wasn't a Hawker. It wasn't a challenger 300, but it wasn't that bad. Yeah, I've got another forty grand in my pocket now instead. Or and that's, or and that's probably happening a lot. I've actually got a nev- another seventy three thousand five hundred grand in, my, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever, um, seventy three five or whatever. And if that is twenty five percent of our market, and that disappears now, it's that's a big change to our market. Yeah. And look, I mean, we, I think we both agree. Nothing is ever so drastic that, you know, other than COVID, right. <clears throat> Nothing's going to disappear there. Will, and, and as the prices fall, people will start to go, Oh, well actually now I'll do it again. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so the market kind of catches the falling price yep. and, and, and then the cycle begins again. Right. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, I, I, look, I'm not going to solve this. You're not going to solve it. It just is what it is. But I think some sense of recognizing that the, 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 the marketplace, the industry takes advantage of the passion and, and that should bother all of us. Yeah. You know, that, that because I love something and because I'm addicted to it or whatever, that therefore I should sacrifice other things. Yeah. Maybe depending on what it is, but not someone's safety. Right. How do you brief your airplane owners that have just gone through, you know, have just seen these rates go through the roof and now they're kind of dipping back down? What's what's the messaging to the airplane owners? Yeah, good question. So we're having those conversations now, um, you know, and I think expectation setting is the basis for all good things in life. Right. I mean, we say communication is, uh, is you know, at the fundamental root of 95 percent of the world's problems. Too much, too little, poor choice of timing, wrong format, you know, whatever. Um, and so we're communicating with owners now on this so that people are aware of where things are headed. Um, you know, it, it's been good for the last couple of years. I mean, there was it was easy to say to basically any reasonable expectation level of charter, I got you covered, you know, yeah. 150, 200 hours. 
well, now people, you know, some of the trips are shorter, uh, you know, um, large cabin airplanes are not just, it's not, you know, it's not uh, LA to London for everybody, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, we're seeing 550s go like, okay, we'll do the Dallas trip out of LA or where we'll yeah. do a New York, Florida run just to keep the crew busy or whatever. Yeah. That's going to get, you know, more prolific, I think. Um, do you think any of the other costs are going to come down because pilot salaries, fuel costs? I mean, these things are still. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, I there's two sides to that for me. Um, I, look, I'm glad. To, I, I, it's good to see people getting paid what it costs yeah. um, to live a life in this world. And, yeah. you know, you want people to be able to take care of their families and, and we want to provide the benefits so that they are safe and comfortable when they're doing their job that their families are taken care of. And, um, you know, on the other hand, the, we've seen some really big jumps in salaries. And yeah. I'm, you know, <clears throat> I mean, that sort of is what it is. And somebody asked me the other day, like, can, can we compete with, you know, the airlines? I mean, that's almost, uh, to me, that's almost a joke. I mean, can the billionaire afford to pay his two or yeah. three pilots yeah. um, or her two or three pilots what it takes to keep them? Yeah, I think they've got that covered. Yeah. Can the industry? No. No, yeah. it's it's a tough mm -hmm. ask. And you've got these owned fleets where they are constrained by the salary numbers, you know, and they have to be competitive. Back to our conversation, you know, how are no, those guys going to survive? Right? Yeah. yeah. And so I on one hand, I think the the pilot pay issue, it's good to see it. It's, I, I don't think it's just pay. I think we have to change the mindset. You know, this notion of just 24-7, 365 being available to go somewhere, that's not realistic for anybody on a long term, right? Yeah. And, and again, I it always comes down to three Cs, communication, compensation, and compromise. Mm -hmm. and, and compromising is usually almost the most important of the three. Um, communication, obviously, is important too. But um, so we'll see. I mean, I, I, I don't think the pendulum is going to swing back and all of a sudden pilot pay is going to go down yeah uh, but i think it's going to it's going to nose over a little bit and yeah. and you know we've had now 3 years in a row basically of uncomfortable conversations with owners about pilot pay and i would say and i've used this phrase with crew a lot and certainly this year um everybody's got a little bit of deal fatigue <laughs> like like, you know, we're because we're going in saying, hey, you know, we got to take care of the team here. And, you know, that guy got a job offer or she's she's yep. at a point where she could be a, a flight risk, so to speak. Yep. After three years of that, a lot of owners are looking at it and going like, OK, enough is enough. Right. Yeah. On the other hand, it's real. I mean, you know, the airlines we've lost, I think, probably call it 12 to the airlines in the last year mm -hmm. versus. Uh, you know, low single digits in the previous two years. Yeah. So that's real. I mean, that's, you have to look at that. And I, you know, I don't view, uh, you know, I don't hate the airlines or anything, but anybody that doesn't recognize that the airlines are fierce competitors to our industry and they are ruthless and will take us down the, um, you remember the airspace, uh, you know, the, the uh, airspace battle that MBAA did a great job yeah. of. Yeah. That that should have, if anybody had questions about where the airlines feel about private aviation or business aviation, that should have solved that. Yeah. I mean, they they would stop at nothing to wipe us out. And it's yeah, really they're so, only worried about themselves. Bingo. And they will take the pilots and whatever. And I um, you know, I think we're in a good position to be able to offer a better deal to people that are like minded and and want to be in this side of the world. Um, airline what jobs are not for everybody and corporate's not for everybody. Yeah. What, what would you tell for us, like younger people that are thinking about being pilots? Uh, yeah. I mean, look, it's, um, I, I have my three boys or, you know, sort of college age and trying to figure out what they're going to do with their lives. And, um, you know, I have friends that work here that were airline people that came into this side of the industry and, and they'll say, God, right now is a great time. You know, you get your seniority number and you do their, your thing, but, you know, I, I think it, it comes down to personality for me, Dan, more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if there's a young person that has other aspirations, they just want to see flying as a job. Um, you know, I think the airlines create a, a good opportunity for that, for those sort of people. If you are someone that likes human interaction, you are, you, you like to be um, intrigued and inspired. You like to learn about the world. You want to deal with a variety of people and situations. 
I think being in our industry is a far more dynamic, interesting thing. I'm biased and I realize that. Um, is there a but, perfect pilot path? Well, it's, it's funny. Um, I think some people think that like, oh yeah, send him to the commuters for a couple of years and then he'll come back or her, she'll come back to, to business aviation. That's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> like, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, there obviously it occasionally happens, but by and large, I'm going to go out on a limb and say 80% of the people that start the journey by going to a commuter are going to end up at a major for their career. And they do a good job of base. Their mousetrap is a pretty good mousetrap. Yeah. And got this I think of it as the, uh, the parking lots, you know, with the, the, the spikes that come up, yeah. you know, yeah. it goes one way, but if you back up and try to go the other way, you get your tires flattened. Yeah. Um, you think, you think there's a way for private aviation to build a similar mousetrap like that. It's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, we're doing some stuff with um, bonus retention, yep. you know, where we can we we reward people on an account by account basis. It needs the owner's participation, obviously, to fund yep. it. Um, you know, we're fortunate, Dan, with our model because I'm spending you know other people's money. Basically, I mean, I'm I'm going to a client and saying she is worth X. Yeah, we should pay her X plus ten percent to sort of as an insurance policy, and yep. you need yep. to be ready for me to come back to you a year from now and bump it again. Yeah. Um, you know, on the other hand, I, I think benefits are a big part of it. You know, we're working on some improvements here in that regard to, to try to beef that up. Cause I think that's important that again, I, I, I think it comes down to pay is one part of it. Quality of life is another. And mm -hmm. one area that we can solve our own problem is in the quality of life category by turning some of these two pilot accounts into three pilot accounts. I believe that young aviators are the key to the kingdom, young aviators and transitioning military pilots. I just mm -hmm. today got a note that a guy that um, had come out of the Navy recently, we placed on an account back East. He had, he had gotten typed in the Gulf Stream, but didn't have a job. And he sort of went out on a limb. And I just got a note this morning that he got placed on an account. And so we're seeing, you know, we've done a shitty job as an industry, private aviation, business aviation of selling what we do to military ready rooms mm -hmm. like full stop mechanics pilots and even administrators 99 percent of the discussions that happen in the ready rooms and the hangars around our country with our service people are around the airlines yeah and what airline can, are you going to join when you're out bingo yeah are you going to fedex ups united or delta yeah. or america yeah. right yeah. um we can fix that and and that but it's going to take an industry effort I think that the young people and the transitioning military people into these smaller flight departments that have two people mm -hmm. solve a couple of problems. Number one, we're, we're building the mousetrap. We're, we're going to take the college kid and instead of her going to Endeavor, she's going to go to XYZ Corporation yep. and, and she's going to get typed in a Challenger 300 and within some reasonable amount of time, she's actually a legitimate useful third crew member think about what that also the the intended consequence of what that does for the existing two pilots mm -hmm. now all of a sudden they've basically got an airline schedule so the second pilot on that account who maybe was a flight risk because he doesn't think he's going to get the you know the cam or the leadership yeah. position he's like this is cakewalk i you know i i work eight to 12 days a month or whatever and and i can i know three months out what my schedule is going to be Yep. That's actually better than the airlines who get a schedule a month in advance typically. Yeah. So yeah. that's a great job. The, the solution. And they get, and they get paid one. Right. And you get, yeah, one. Well, and again, you got to go back to the core for some people. They don't want the human interaction with the people in the back of the airplane. They don't like the variety of, you know, yes, today I went from Chicago to Florida, but next week I'm going to London, right? That's mm -hmm. not the airline, typical yeah. airline schedule. Um, on the other hand, some people might say, you know, dealing with the public in the way that airline pilots frequently have to, or the commuting and the, just the constantly being in a big international airport. Some people don't like that. I wouldn't want that for me. Yeah. Well, Dan, I, I really appreciate you coming on. I have my uh, pleasure, Dan. Thanks for the opportunity. I really enjoyed catching up with you and chatting about some of this stuff.